Okay, I think we are live. Uh, if anybody who's watching can just pour, uh, put in the comments whether or not you can hear us and it's working, that would be great. So we make sure we're not talking to ourselves um, as that has happened before. So just let us know in the YouTube comments if you can hear us. Um, looks like it just started, so we'll wait a minute for. Um, okay, I think we are live. Uh, if anybody who's watching can. Yeah, they can hear us. <laughs> all right all right we can start. okay sounds good so thumbs up it's working okay we're going to start just with introductions so i'm jessica levesque i'm the executive director at c4 and i'm really excited to be here and i'm excited for cheyenne our cep committee leader to be with us and then we also have willie who is working at shapeshift dow and i'll let them do intros on themselves and then we will get into um eth slang so cheyenne all right thanks jessica yeah thank you um so i'm cheyenne uh, currently cto at ether capital um i have like so many side projects and one of the things that i'm proud that i'm working on is cp and with c4 team which is like, a fascinating team um and for those that have been around, like CEP certified Ethereum profession, uh, which we um, do certification and exam and all these kind of thing, you can read more on the website. And um, glad to be here, really. Hey everybody, my name is Willie. Uh, by day, I am currently head of decentralization at the Fox Foundation, which is a not-for-profit foundation set up to support the Shapeshift DAO in achieving its mission of full decentralization. Um, by night, I am working with Giveth. I'm building the future of giving. Love your hat, Cheyenne. It's looking great. And yeah, excited to be here and chat some slang with you guys. Cool. Well, so let's just do a quick intro into why we're doing this live stream, what the purpose of it is. So once people start to join any community, there's always like words and phrases that you have to pick up on. And within the Ethereum community and open blockchains, I think that the learning curve can be quite a bit steeper than in other places because it's such a fun, um, unique environment that there are always these new terms, slang that people are using. So it's hard to really get involved when you don't know when people say like, hey, GM, wag me friends. And you're like, what? Uh, you have to learn another language in order to participate with this. And so you don't, but it is helpful to start to learn different terminology. And Slang has a few different purposes. And I think one of the important pieces is bringing people together and making them really feel like they're connecting with other people with similar interests. And the Ethereum community does this really well. There's a ton of different slang terms that are used that make people feel connected in a way that's like, oh, you get me. You get why this matters to me and it matters to you. And now we can like go on to, you know, accomplish the mission that we've set out to. So terms like, FUD, WAGME, GM, all of these different things. And there's constantly new ones popping up, which can make it difficult because it's like you constantly need to learn something new, but it also, in my opinion, makes it more fun. And that's one of the reasons that we wanted Willie to join us today because he is, I think, maybe a little hipper than some of the other people on our team. So we're excited that he can help us explain more about these terms and answer the questions that you all have either in the Slido um, question area where you go to slido.com and just use the code ETHSLANG or you can ask them in the YouTube chat or on Twitter and we'll try to get to all of them. So um, yeah, why don't we talk a little bit about how we got into the Ethereum community and any, um, I guess, any of the terms that we've come across when we first started maybe that we didn't know about and um, we found interesting. So do so you want to jump on that? Yeah, it's fun to think back to when we were first getting into Ethereum, and uh, it's always fun to put yourselves in the shoes of a, of a newcomer coming into this like really interesting community and, and space. Um, Cheyenne, when was it for you? When did you first get into Ethereum? Oh, um, so it's before Ethereum existed, but um, I was like looking at the Ethereum white paper. I was like another altcoin, but then uh, I was working with Bitcoin ATMs back then in 2015, and there were like so many, and one of the early on was like ICOs, which a lot of people were saying ICOs, like different ways of saying it. Um, but I remember reading about Ethereum and it was like more, so this whole culture goes back to like a long time. Like there was like these, um, 
what was it called even? I keep forgetting. Like with the SegWit and like block size debate, there was like so many things going on. UASF, UASF was like user activated soft fork. All those come from back then. Heard a which new word already. Hats. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you need it anymore <laughs> because it's part of the protocol right now. Um, and it was more, I was tired of the drama around the block size debate was like dragging for so long. And Ethereum was this new cool kid in the block that you could do things with. Um, and and that's Solidity pre 0 0.4, which is like a different syntax than now. <laughs> Um, but that's pretty good story. And from there on, I'm like more than full time working on all things essential. Um, so that's more or less the story. Yeah. yeah I just, I think, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, please. Yeah, you know, so yeah, it's interesting um, looking back because the industry has come so far, the communities have come so far, mm -hmm. slang has come so far, especially over the past couple of years. I feel like there's almost been an inflection point. And I feel like a lot of the slang, I might be biased because I love Ethereum and the Ethereum community, but I feel like the Ethereum community is doing a really good job of coming up with cool new slang terms that are spreading quickly and virally uh, and, getting, and getting adoption pretty quickly. Because like I'm thinking back to when, you know, 2017 and before then, and I feel like a lot of the slang then, it was more of these like acronyms, jargon, um, UTXOs, you know, uh, FUD was was sort of like that that came from the original finance industry and we just kind of adopted that. Now we have much more cool, cool slang terms, I would say. Do you want to define so, what FUD means? Yeah. For yeah, listeners? FUD, fear, uncertainty, doubt. So it's what all the haters put out um, when they're trying to um, put fear, uncertainty, doubt out into the into the world around crypto or specific blockchains. Yeah, and FUDers is actually one of the terms somebody asked about today. So yeah, I'm glad you just used it. It's FUD and FUDers. Um, but yeah, it is like, it's so cool how the, I'm an English major, so I love how language um, kind of is adaptive and it changes along with, you know, culture and situations. And it's fun to become a part of something and then to have your vocabulary actually change along with it. And then once you start to notice yourself using these terms, it's like, this unique way to make that connection, like I said before, but also to be like, oh, I can use GM now as well. And it doesn't feel weird. And like now it's that extra layer of connection. So um, when I say GM at, at um, you know, 9 p.m. at night, what do I mean? Yeah, you mean uh, good morning, right? And uh, the cool thing about uh, GM, I think one of, maybe one of the reasons that GM has become so popular lately is that a lot of us are collaborating online from different parts of the world. And so, um, you know, it's, you might, before, if you say good morning, maybe it's actually evening for somebody and, and that can be a little bit awkward, but GM, you can say any time of the day and it's totally accepted. Yeah, it's similar to when you, you say it's um, 5 p.m. somewhere or like 420 somewhere in the world to drink up or other things that you do. Um, it's similar to that because GM, like we work, it's, a, it's one earth, it's morning somewhere, so. Mm -hmm. um, it's really inclusive, which I think is a big part of the Ethereum community's like draw is that anybody can and there is this like want for people from all over the world to be involved in it and it's not um, specific to one area and saying GM at any time shows that it is welcoming and somebody who is across the world is welcome to participate. And some of the, the things that I've noticed since beginning to participate in Shapeshift DAO, which is how I've met Willie, is that people say GM like all the time in a really positive way. So it's not like, you know, back in the day when you go into an actual office and people are like, yeah, good morning. I need my coffee. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. It's like, oh God, now people are like, hi. And it's like, oh God, people are excited that I'm here. And that feels good. And I'm excited to be here. And it like infuses this positivity that I think has been lacking in other workspaces um, in, you know, past years and has kind of made this such a fun area to be in and to participate. And as a mental health advocate, having that level of like comfort and people showing you they want you to be there, I think is really important to just, you know, humankind in general. Yeah, great yeah, points. Go ahead. That's a good point to get into uh, wag me as like, because that is a, one of the things like NGMI or the, uh, are the things that used to like get more people together. A lot of times on a downside market or things are like um, not going well, you can say like, let's do this, let's do that, wag me, like we're going to make it. 
Um, uh, is it making it? Like me? Yeah. <laughs> like I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, or, or when you're talking about like your some competition or some chat fight doing some blocking of like blockchain, you you say like NGMI, like not going to make it. So all these are going to like these words that other than just translating, like just being words trans- transfers like a whole emotion of like what you're going through as like, let's do this. We're going to make it. Um, and I've seen that a lot in like up and down of the market or protocols that happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah, GM and, and Wagme are definitely two of my favorites. And I think we're, we're touching on some important, valuable themes here of uh, inclusivity. You mentioned Jess and, and positivity and both, it, which are so valuable for communities, especially communities like our own, where it's a lot of, you know, people that don't have never met in person or meeting online. We're trying to coordinate and collaborate. We're working on really difficult problems. Sometimes we have weeks where the market's down, you know, 50%. And so it's extra important that we have inclusive terms uh, and that we can, you know, be positive and have fun. Rule number one is, is have fun. And uh, I think it's it's awesome that we can, uh, you're making me think just like in these communities as a brand newcomer, I'm really trying to put myself into the shoes of the newcomer because that's a big part of the, the audience for this talk. And if you're a brand new um, community member, um, you know, a lot of the community members have already built relationships. They feel pretty confident jumping in Discord and expressing their opinions and stuff. But if you're brand new, you know, maybe you're not, you don't feel like you're an expert. You might feel a little bit of imposter syndrome even. And being able to just say GM, you know, and, and get involved and start engaging. It's super low barrier. Anyone can say it. And that's oftentimes what we see. We just see these huge threads of everyone waking up saying GM. And it does. It makes you feel positive much more than just like at the office, like you said, of like, oh, good morning. So I love GM. GM everybody out there. Yeah. And I like that point about when you don't know how to begin participating in a community, having terminology you can you see other people using that you can easily use as well to kind of bridge that gap of where do I even begin? And, you know, I've been in the space for over five years. And for me, like I was like, oh, you know, shapeshift's turning into a DAO. I want to see what it looks like and how it works. But even though I've been in the space for five years, I don't regularly say GM. So it's like, oh, now if I'm saying GM, I'm connected in this new way that I wasn't before. And I think that it's really um, like, it just changes everything. I know that might sound dramatic and idealistic, but I guess that's just how I am. But it's like this beautiful thing where you say a word and somebody reciprocates it. And it's like, oh, okay, now I'm part of this community already. Like people know what I'm saying and I'm like in the lingo, but it, it, it can be difficult to learn the lingo. And that's kind of why we wanted to do this stream because ETH Denver is coming up. A lot of people are going to that. And I remember my first experience at ETH Denver and I was nervous to be perfectly honest because I didn't know if I knew all of the right terms and was someone going to come up to me and say something. And I'd be like, you know, hi, I'm Jessica. I'm the executive director at C4. And they'd be like, oh, okay, blah, blah, blah. And I'd be like, and I don't know what you're saying. So that's embarrassing, you know? So it's like, I would would have liked for this to have existed before I went to East Denver. So that's why we did it because there are people that constantly are asking for help. They don't know where to go and they're embarrassed about it. And I guess we should put that out there. It is not embarrassing to not know what a term means. What's embarrassing is to pretend like you know what things are when you don't because of imposter syndrome. And then you get into the situation where you've been in the space for five years and somebody says something to you. And then you're like, I don't know what you're talking about still because I never admitted that I didn't know. Um, maybe not, maybe embarrassing is not the right word, but it's not helpful. And there are so many people that have been in this position. Like everybody starts at some point and doesn't know what the terms are. So, anyways, the point of what I'm making, the point I'm making is ask your questions either here in the YouTube chat. You can do it anonymously in Slido. Um, you can message us. If you're part of the Shapeshift DAO, you can message us on um, the DMs or in the chat. However, whatever makes you feel comfortable. Um, so anything else we want to talk about before we get into some of the other terms that are being um, asked? I wanted to, like you, you mentioned on some interesting point really was like talking about like looking at this as a new, as a new user. Um, so it's it might not be something that everyone thought about. Like I did this paper back in, uh, back in the day about Bitcoin usability. And there was this whole methodology called cognitive walkthrough, which was like, as an expert or someone that knows the field, you should be able to like forget about everything you know and look if the app, the terminology, the way people are using it, gives you the feedback to know if you're using it. Like similar to you, if 
you go to almost every Discord right now, like you see this channel, sometimes even called GM. You go in there and people say GM, they react with GM, they, it's just all GM and you're like, GM? And people react to you. So it, that is a good feedback loop of like telling the user, oh, here's, you can, because usually the first message on every chat platform is the hardest. It's like, how should I introduce myself? What should I do? Uh, with that, they can get engaged. But to be honest, like Discord is overwhelming. So it's all okay if you go to the Discord channel and already the platform is overwhelming and with all these DAOs, it's like a bit too much. It's okay. Like a lot of times it happened to me that there are these audio channels in Discord that you can just click. There's someone there and you start talking and you even fix your problem without knowing that person's name. That's the beauty of this whole space that I like, that people want to help each other. And it's not necessarily asking like, who are you, what you're working on, and do you like, um, should I wait, like spend my time on you? Like it's, that is not the question people ask. It's like, oh, you're here, GM, like what's going on? So that's one of the things I really love about um, some of the Discord channels that I've been joining. Um, yeah, but it's it might be overwhelming. Don't worry, it is <laughs> for everyone. <laughs> I love that about these Discord communities that you can just hop in there and get involved. So much lower barrier than than even you know doing that in real life for sure. And you could do it anonymously. You know, if you are feeling nervous or you know you, you, you you're uh, nervous about asking a question, feel free to just join a Discord and Discord and throw a an NFT avatar profile pic, and you'll be welcomed with open arms. And one last What's thing I want to add. Oh yeah, non fungible token. And um, yeah, we'll definitely dive into into NFTs. Um, uh, one thing I wanted to add before we dive into the acronyms, uh, Jess, that I love that you mentioned was, um, and you'll see if I, I've lost my thought. Sorry, it's been a long week, you guys. Um, but uh, oof, it's so just sorry. Wednesday. It's, I know it's right. Hey, <laughs> you're talking to somebody who has ADHD, and my thoughts are like always pinging around. So you're in good company if you're um, if you have oh. lost thought. Okay, I got it back. back. It was just yeah, just as important as understanding the slang. I love that you you said uh, just how uh, you were nervous when you first came in and uh, you didn't even know if you could ask these questions. And I thought I think it's so interesting. That, I'm so glad you said that because I think probably a lot of us when we are newcomers into this space feel the same way because it is such a deep rabbit hole. And so unless you're insane, it's probably it's good that you have self awareness that if you're a newcomer, like you recognize that you don't know a lot and you're you know it's it's. I think a lot of us are also nervous when we go to these conferences when there's so many brilliant people just you know to ask questions but the interesting thing is that the ethereum community is so welcoming i don't know of like a more welcoming community out there they're so supportive and i've never seen anybody like ask a question and get shot down by somebody or, or be judged so just keep that in mind just as important as studying up on all these terms is is just don't be afraid to ask questions when you go to these conferences or when you join these communities people will be happy to help out yeah i think that's a good point i've never had anyone laugh cruelly when I've asked what I would consider to be a dumb question. I know people say like, there are no dumb questions. Well, there are questions that we feel dumb asking, which I think is important to note, but like I ask questions all of the time that I'm sure other people are like, oh, why are you asking this? But there's always somebody else who's thinking, yes, somebody asked the question that I wanted to ask, but didn't feel like I could ask. And so, yeah, there, are, I've never experienced that where people are like, oh, you don't know what GM is like by, you know, it, it is a really cool welcoming community. And one of the things that I think helps with that in a really cool way is like the unicorn rainbow situation that a lot of people that first jump in are like, this is different than like traditional banking finance world. Like why are there rainbows? And it's like, well, because we are welcoming and inclusive and unicorns are awesome. And um, it's a different kind of environment. And I think that the um, appearance of it, both in language and the visuals really speaks to that in a way that like kind of feels like warm and fuzzy. Yes, we love the unicorns and rainbows. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so why don't we back up a little bit and then we'll get into more of the terms. So Ethereum, if you're here, you probably know what Ethereum is. You might have seen the use of ETH, ETH. Um, Cheyenne, do you want to explain what ETH means? Um, <laughs> all right. So you mean I know that's like the that's token or they? <laughs> How about this? Is it ETH or ETH, Cheyenne? Oh, I know there was like um, the whole controversy around that. I I say ETH because Ethereum. Like they just say use it that way, but. 
you can say it anything you want like as long as you can communicate and you're willing to like say it again and again till that person is understanding um that's fine um you say eth or eth willie i say eth i've heard yeah there was some controversy around it and this is interesting too because technically isn't you know ethereum is the blockchain right and ether is the is the currency of, of that blockchain but i barely ever hear anyone actually use ether i almost always hear people just call it ethereum or, or eth but i think that's part of where the controversy comes from right yeah and while we're here we can talk about um g way or way because like a lot of people about gas they're talking about this um and we can like, talk about like some of the details um so we can go around i say g way i say guay guay yeah. yeah yeah i don't even know what i say because i don't think i say it out <laughs> loud that often which yeah. leads me to like, have you guys ever been somewhere public where you've said something incorrectly? Like I always say hodl because that's how I read it for a really long time. And I've actually said hodl on a podcast where someone was like hodl. And I was like, <laughs> oh yeah. But like, if you read something and you're always in a chat room or doing something online and then suddenly you hear it, it's like, it's been ingrained in your head for so long as whatever it is. So same thing with, I guess I do, I guess I do read it as gway. And it's interesting. A lot of these these yeah. terms were born on the internet, right? And so there's like, especially HODL, that, that was a typo in a forum post, the Bitcoin talk forum. So, yeah. um, you know, the pronunciation, there's no official pronunciation, right? And so it's kind of just, mm -hmm. I've heard HODL, I've heard HODL. I'm not sure which one's right. So I think for a lot of these are safe, safe with uh, either of those pronunciations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People will know, you know the about. culture, because like one of the things I notice is like a, the new generation say like, hold on dear life, even though that was like, kind of human brain starts off with a story on like explaining what happened in the past. But as you said, HODL was like, or HODL was um, on a forum saying like, don't sell, like hold, hold, hold. And then the typo was there. And it goes back to a lot of like these gamer culture and like hacker culture that pawning is a thing, PWN, if you have seen that. And that was mostly on these like strategic games that you would attack a city and own that city. You would just have on have like on the chat say, I own the city and I'm moving on. So O and P are like right after each other. So instead of like owned, you say pawned. And that became a thing on like a whole hacker culture on like pawning devices and like you know, hacking things. A lot of these um, older generation slangs had to do with typos, which is interesting. And new ones are like, one thing I don't really like what's being used in the community a lot is biddle, which I'm like, D and L are not close. Like, how would you <laughs> do that? And it was like coming up from that whole culture. Um, but it's interesting. You're just you're building so hard. You're typing so fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like two different. Uh, exactly. I'm typing these in the YouTube chat for anybody who's listening and is wondering what some of these mean that we're saying. I'm adding them as we go. Just it, Biddle's an interesting one. I actually I really like Biddle. Uh, the reason I like Biddle is because uh, originally you know it was an adaptation from HODL, and HODL really came yeah. from the Bitcoin community. It was like you know hold, don't sell, and Ethereum kind of adapted it and said you know what we're going to take this and we're going to make it about building hashtag Biddle and uh, and it spread really quickly. It's like I yeah. if you go to my Twitter profile, I have Biddle in my bio because I love it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Biddle the change you wish to see in the world. No, I, I don't get me wrong. I love the culture around it, but right. coming up with the word and using the same thing was like it's not the same like going into technical details it's interesting yeah, yeah. there's yeah. a debate going on in the youtube chat about if it's gif or jif uh oh what do you guys say <laughs> i don't i have no comment on this no. <laughs> i said jif uh, i think even the, the and i say gif so. oh i say gif i say gif because so. you know we got giffy now and then if jiffy isn't that like peanut butter so just you know <laughs> <laughs> hungry if anyone's like oh i sent this jeff i'm like okay now i need to go eat thanks a lot <laughs> um okay so let's see what some of the others oh this is a really good question that i actually have asked recently and still don't think i fully understand what is a dgen i think i'm using it incorrectly so i'm not going to answer this one I think if you look up dgen in the dictionary you see a, a picture of my my face so <laughs> Yes, there's, right, there's, there's DGENs and we got regions, which is a new adaptation of an evolution of DGENs that I absolutely love. So um, a DGEN is somebody who apes, and I'll try to, we'll, we'll explain what ape is, I guess, in a second, but um, somebody who makes investment decisions with very little diligence. I think that's a fair way to put it. Um, it's, it's like a mix between like a, an investor uh, or, or a gambler and a gambler. Um, so DGENs, uh, you know, they like to, uh, find projects that have, you know, 
APRs ideally in like the quadruple digits, you know, you know, triple, di you know, triple digits are okay, but ideally those, those APRs, those annual percentage returns are in the quadruple digits. Um, maybe they're getting into a project right when it launches at the early stages. These are definitely the higher risk projects, but with the, the best potential of rewards. And it can be a bit addictive. Once you, once you have your first DJ and win where you get your first hundred X and stuff, you feel pretty confident and you get sucked into that DJ rabbit hole. Anything you want to add on, on DGENs before we dive into regions, Cheyenne? Um, no, I just like basically what you said in dictionary, I looked at urban dictionary. <laughs> like, so uh, source for all these, and it says a stock trader, stock market trader who YOLOs all their money on a de degenerate investment in the hoping of it, it mooning. Um, it's interesting that every everything we're trying to explain, we come up with other like slangs in the between there is like, oh, wait, <laughs> we have to explain this. And YOLO is like, you only live once means like just all in it's it's borderline gambling a lot of times <laughs> um but yeah like go for a region and we can do a comparison of region and degen cool cool so yeah degen as you can imagine it doesn't have like the most positive connotations it comes from degenerative so you know a, a word that's typically negative but um you know degens it's not the most negative thing i wouldn't be offended if anyone calls you a degen it's almost kind of like a compliment because again it means you're part of this community it's your degen you're, you're deep in the community right you're embedded so there's at you least that called one in the chat by the way willie just so <laughs> what what <laughs> no i think that's fair yeah i, I embrace the degen but i try to be more of a region uh, and so region is this new evolution uh, a big part of the ethereum community is public goods building open source public goods not only how can we uh, make our own selves wealthy, but how can we make everybody wealthy? How can we make the world a better place? And so regions are uh, the best of both worlds, where you can still have great uh, returns on your investments, your gambles, but also support the world, not just extract value, but also these, these uh, models that uh, can benefit everybody, all stakeholders, including you as an individual who's uh, investing. Um, and I like that. Just I because that like... Before. Uh, just because like you mentioned um, this, um, like this is a good segue to ask you this question. What is give economy? I just want to <laughs> give a shout out and to like, give a theme. And what is give economy? Because I've seen that a lot on there. <laughs> yeah. No, so give economy. You are. Uh, yeah, I appreciate it. We're, we're right in the middle of this whole region movement. Um, give it as uh, is, is give it.io, the future of giving. Cheyenne's wearing our lovely uh, give garden hat, rocking it, uh, looking great. Um, and the Give Economy, uh, we just launched on uh, Christmas Eve, so it's like a month old, and uh, it's the economy that powers the future of giving. So Give is our token. It's the governance token for the Give Garden, which is that hat that Cheyenne's wearing. Um, some cool aspects of the giving economy. Right now, you can donate to about a thousand verified projects on Give It. Cool projects in a variety of categories all around the world, and then you can earn Give tokens back. Um, we call those give backs. It's kind of like decentralized tax deductions. It's uh, reimbursements for donations that don't re rely on nation states or taxes, and they're borderless. Um, then uh, part of the, the really cool region tokenomics is uh, that donations uh, to projects, or sorry, donations to causes on Giveth. This is one of the upcoming features we're launching. Um, we'll sit in escrow for about 45 days before they're allocated as matching donations. So you'll be able to either donate to a cause and trust that 100% of your donation goes to projects or donate to a project and get not only 100% of your donation goes to that project, but you get a matching donation from this pool of funds from people who donate to causes. Um, those donations to causes will sit in escrow for about 45 days and earn yield. So we can deploy them into DeFi, we can use these awesome money Legos at our fingertips and generate potentially billions of dollars of yield from uh, if we get hundreds of billions of dollars of the, of the existing donations to flow through give it, which why shouldn't they? You know, it's, it's super easy, great experience, no fees added, directly, don't just go directly to projects, super transparent. It really, you know, it's very disruptive because it is free, because we can do this in a way where it's no fees added, but still generate potentially billions of dollars uh, that go to the give treasury and are uh, governed by give token holders. So that's some beautiful region tokenomics there. Um, a great example of one and something that I'm really, really excited about. What kind of projects are happening on Giveth? A, a whole, pretty much the whole variety. So we have categories for like all of the uh, sustainable development goals. Each of those, there's like 17 different categories that the SDG published. So uh, we have projects within each of those categories. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah there's, you can SDG? probably find something you, you care about. Yeah. SDG, yeah, sustainable development goals. That was, oh, I see. yeah, yeah. Yeah, and like it really like the whole giving give economy reminds me of this is outside crypto for once. Um, so Reddit had this um, thing called Reddit gifts, 
uh, which was like basically on gift economies. One of the projects I really loved and they kind of killed it this year. I'm really sad about that. But like it was mainly um, you could just go write a profile as like who you, who you are and like what you li like. And for different days, like Christmas, sometimes like Earth Day, sometimes like 80s nostalgic, you would just send like you would be matched with someone random in the in the country or in the world and you would send them a gift and you would receive a gift from someone else, like not the same person. And the, it was just based on like the trust and like the giving. Uh, and it was not like a lot of my friends asked me like, so what, why are you sending like buying this random person a gift? Like when you, maybe someone won't give, buy you something. I'm like, yeah, that's the risk. But the whole idea of like sending a random, like looking at the random person's life and profile and buying them a gift, was something that like, I never experienced before and was so beautiful, like it was so nice. Um, and based on the world that we live in, I, I don't see uh, why they could, they, it, they killed down this project because it was not in a capitalist model, <laughs> you could say, um, even though people were like enjoying it, it was based on give economy. So it really reminds me of that, this whole give backs. And it's like, I'm helping this random project. I'm getting some return from this like, give it. We are all helping each other to get there. Uh, to make it I, I love it, it. I really love it. Yeah. yeah it's my favorite favorite uh style of projects too and technically shapeshift is basically i think i consider shapeshift one of these region projects too because we're again everything we're building now is open source there's no fees added we really are building just public goods that are just like a gift to society and to the world but we're coming up with really creative tokenomic models where we can still generate revenues i think generate even more revenues than if we were to just provide or put fees on top of these protocols um but doing so in a, in a regenerative way and I should also mention we do. Uh, we, we, the last thing about Giveth is we. Uh, if you go to give.giveth.io, uh, you'll see the Giveth farm. So you can farm um, and earn. We do have some quadruple digit yields there right now. So if you're looking to becoming a region, definitely check out the Giveth economy and the Giveth farms right now. So yeah, that point, what is farming? Yeah, what's the farm, right? Yeah. Uh, so farming, um, it's a it's an umbrella term, and I think farming pretty much encompasses any kind of. Uh, DeFi strategy where you're basically like staking a token and earning another token as rewards, or maybe it's the same token that you're earning as rewards, basically. But typically, what farming is is projects. Uh, every project that creates a token, it's it very important for that a project's token to have liquidity on these decentralized exchanges, right? Because we, anyone can create a token. Um, you're not these days. You're probably not going to get listed on a centralized exchange anytime soon when you create your token. But anyone can go list a token on a decentralized exchange. But in order for people to actually be able to trade tokens on these decentralized exchanges, you need liquidity. And so farming uh, has become a very popular method for projects to take tokens that they have in their own treasury, these tokens they just created, and use them to incentivize uh, token holders to provide liquidity of their token on DEXs, probably paired with another token like ETH. Um, and then take the liquidity pool tokens that you get when you provide liquidity on a DEX, stake those in a farming contract, and then earn uh, a portion of the rewards basically based on how what uh, percentage of the uh the pool you are or really uh what percentage of all the tokens staked in the farm you hold that's farming i love farming uh, especially if you're uh, it's a great way if you're if you like projects um and they have a farming program and you're already going to be hold that project's token and be long on it it's a great way to uh put those tokens to work instead of just having them sit idly in your wallet you can put them into a liquidity pool, support the project, and then earn uh, sometimes quadruple digit rewards on your liquidity. Yeah, just like one point about that, so a lot of projects, it's similar to like ICO time that a lot of projects existed just because they could have a token, like they, they want to have a token. Like farming is a good thing to support the projects that are doing things, but there are tons of projects that just exist because of farming and like really yield. Like, try to like do your own or another example is dyor like you might see that here and there it's like do your own research um and it is yeah. it should be a motto in the whole space like you have to know like don't, don't listen do your own research google figure it out um and to that point yeah yes dyor that was probably one of the first terms that i learned uh especially it was in the ico phase right and everyone's like do you, you know here's a cool project but dyor dyor and on that note nfa not financial advice. None of what we're saying today is financial advice. <laughs> yes, very good point. I just put into the chat what an ICO is, and then yes, not financial <laughs> advice, none of this. Um, for sure, important to say. Um, so, okay, we've talked a little bit about Giveth, Give Token. Um, Willie, you are originally, you worked at 
um, centralized Shapeshift, and you are now um, working for Shapeshift Foundation, and you do a lot with Shapeshift DAO. Do you want to talk a little bit about what Shapeshift DAO does, and um, I guess why you believe in it? And um, I'll jump into to talk about it as well, since it's something that I've become um, involved in too. That sounds great. Yeah, and we'll talk about what is a DAO, right? So DAO stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. What the heck does, does that mean, right? So I think one definition that I really like for DAOs is that DAOs are basically just like a group of people coordinating on chain to manage a treasury of assets. I think that's a pretty good broad term that encompasses DAOs. Maybe you don't have to have a treasury of assets. Maybe you know they're coordinating around something else online, but typically these DAOs, it's a group of people that manage a treasury of assets on chain. Um, so Shapeshift DAO, um, uh, you know, how do we how do we manage these assets? Typically, there's a governance token. Our governance token is Fox. So Fox token holders govern this treasury of assets on chain. It's about I think 100 million dollars worth of assets right now, mostly Fox. But um, you know, right now, obviously, it's in Fox token holders' best interest to grow the value of that treasury and diversify it a little bit, right? Uh, try and get some other assets in there so that in the event of a bear market, um, just like Shapeshift had, you know, uh, assets in our balance sheet to cover our expenses and have runway so that we could make plans longer than one month. Uh, the It's in the DAO's best interest to make sure that we have, you know, runway to execute on our vision and survive through a potential bear market. That's a big focus for the Shapeshift DAO right now. Uh, it's been really cool to see. It's been uh, seven months now, six and a half months since we launched the DAO and did an airdrop. Uh, so an airdrop is we uh, dropped tokens to past users. So oftentimes, you know, when you create a DAO, it's not really decentralized. Uh, uh, it's not a DAO unless you your token unless there's token holders unless there's a group of people holding your governance tokens. If you're the only one holding your governance token, it's not really a DAO yet. Although it can start there, but you got to figure out how do we get these tokens out to uh, our community members, the people that we want to have governance rights in our organization. And uh, so a lot of projects will start with an airdrop, um, which is where they just uh, it's up to you. If you do an airdrop, you can kind of decide who do we want to give our tokens to, right? Um, and then. After that, your tokens are out in the wild, and then it's up to the token holders to decide what happens going forward. So when we launched the DAO, we had a governance process. It was kind of a gift to the community. And it's like, hey, here's the whole process for making proposals to the DAO, because anytime you want to get funds out of this large treasury, you need to make a proposal, and then token holders need to vote on whether or not they want to approve that proposal or reject it. Um, so we, when we launched the DAO, we set up a governance process. We set up our DAO stack, uh, so like all of the different tools that we assembled these different Legos that we assembled to DAO it. So we had like a multi-sig contract. We had a voting tool called Snapshot. And uh, we had a forum where people could discuss these ideas. And uh, together, that was kind of like what we started with. We gave that to the community. And then we said, hey, going forward, Fox token holders, uh, if you guys want to change any of this stuff, it's up to you. Um, and here's the process to make proposals and execute them. So since then, yeah, we've uh, we've made we've it's pretty cool. Just last week, we launched our first uh, project that or product that the DAO built entirely itself. It's app.shapeshift.com. It's a new version of Shapeshift. It's fully open source. It's community owned. It's uh, um, multi chain. So it's not just Ethereum. It's not just Bitcoin. It's not just Cosmos. But it is just like Shapeshift designed. We've always believed in a multi chain future, and we think that needs to exist. It supports multiple wallets. I love Ledger Live, but I don't ever think Ledger Live is going to be the interface to the decentralized universe because it only supports ledgers and there's more There's more wallets out there. So we support as many wallets as we can. Um, it's non-custodial. We never hold users' funds. It's free, which I think is cool. Back to that region model. We're not putting any fees on top of this. And what's really cool is that we're designing it and it's architected in a way to be fully decentralized. So whereas the, the past versions of Shapeshift designed on our, uh, relied on our own uh, infrastructure and uh, servers that we hosted, this new version of Shapeshift is designed to not rely on any centralized hosting infrastructure whatsoever and be fully decentralized. So yeah, and a big part of uh, what we're building into Shapeshift right now is we're integrating and then we're aggregating DeFi protocols. And so maybe we could, we'll, we could talk about DAOs and then maybe we'll talk about DeFi. I think DeFi could be a fun term to jump into. Yeah, yeah. but you mentioned some things I want to like get through and get into that because I'd love to ha have like a more case studies or like more practical sentences like so for our audience like if you see a project that has done an airdrop meaning that send an airdrop to their users or their team DYOR <laughs> do your own research and figure out how many like of those tokens are belong to like similar entities so in order to prevent a rug pull 
and now we can talk about like um what a rock pool is um i don't know we, like, do you got, really want to like start it or should i like give some ideas yeah i've been rugged before and it's a it's yeah. a and it's because i did not do the research so great point there um yeah the uh, uh a rug pull is basically when the rug gets pulled out from underneath you. So, you know, you, you invest in a project, you get their tokens. You're hoping, obviously, that the token value won't go to zero. But typically, a rug pull involves, like, the token value, value suddenly going to zero. And that can be caused by a variety of things. But oftentimes, uh, you know, it's because it's it's a malicious, malicious developers, basically, that they launch a project with the intention of getting people to, like, provide liquidity and buy into it with the intention of pulling that rug out once there's a, a large honeypot. And like one way they can do that is they can, um, if they are able to mint new tokens, they can like, you know, they could do an airdrop and they could do a farming program saying, hey, go provide liquidity for yeah. our token on this on this DEX and you'll earn more rewards. And, you know, DGens will be like, yeah, let's go. Yeah, let's ape into this. Uh, let's YOLO. And then, uh, you know, if they don't uh, do their own research and read the contract code, you know, the cool thing is that all this stuff is transparent. So if you can read Solidity contracts, you can, you can do your own research and, um, you know, know exactly what you're getting into. There's no, there's no trust required. It can be trustless if you can do that research. But uh, yeah, let's say that the token project had the, uh, the ability in their, in their token contract to mint more tokens. Um, then, you know, uh, they could mint, you know, a billion more tokens and then sell them all on that DEX pool and dump on all of these people who have provided liquidity, steal all that liquidity effectively out of the pool and leave all those liquidity providers with a token that's worth nothing. So that's, mm. that's a rug pull. And they're, they're, you know, in this, in this dark forest, this open free world of Ethereum and stuff, there's a lot of amazing projects, but there's also a lot of opportunity for scammers to, to do rug pulls. Yeah. So definitely one of my careful. favorite, um, a rug Sorry, pull is quick, like all over the jump place. In. Can we explain what minting is? Cause we're not talking about peppermint, which is delicious, sure. but, um, do you want to quickly explain that? Or you can jump to your point, Cheyenne and go back to it. No, I can try to do that. So minting is when you create new, like minting a, a coin in the real world, like create creating a new token. And um, this can be additional to the whole supply of tokens that everyone has. It can be like an ERC20 token, which is a normal token or an NFT, a new like NFT. And I wanted to talk about this one actually, is that there's a lot of like rock pools happening, like with NFT teams that have like roadmap and other stuff. But one of my favorite rock pools uh, was that someone, so for NFTs, there's basically a picture, metadata and some of the information. Someone sold a bunch of NFTs to people and did a rug pull, meaning changing the picture of all the NFTs to Persian rugs. Yeah. And that was my favorite. I and mean, it has like actually a lot more value right now, those Persian <laughs> rugs. So they did an NFT rug pull. Um, it was fascinating. When you said it was you have a favorite rug pull, I was like, how can you have a favorite <laughs> rug pull? But now I get it. Yeah, a lot oh, of times no. it's like, it comes back to the hacker culture that like you have to prove your point by doing it sometimes. That like it, they were talking around like NFTs being, the picture is being sent in a, on a server, hosted on a server. So anyone can just like rock pull or like change a picture on you. And this guy, like this person that this rock, rock pull with two Persian rugs. And I love the whole idea around it. Um, yeah, so I think I just want to add that one. Yeah, so you brought up um, NFTs as well. So maybe we should talk about DeFi. Um, I don't think we've defined that and then move into NFTs and um, everything related to that. So what is DeFi? Aside from fun to say. Oh, is, I've, heard, I've heard that one before. Um, <laughs> <laughs> pretty popular buzzword right now, for sure. I think DeFi is just, it's, a, it's an umbrella term that kind of encompasses any financial instrument that um, is a on the protocol layer, so it's you know it's it's powered by smart contracts uh, or protocols as opposed to uh, you know a centralized organization or an application. Um, so that can be everything from um, you know lending and borrowing to uh, providing liquidity, being like a, a market maker essentially. Um, earning yield, you know, depositing assets into DeFi, into strategies. It really can encompass all sorts of kind of cool stuff as long as it's on that protocol layer and decentralized, right? Um, uh, and uh, yeah, and probably even new things we haven't thought about yet. And something on that note that you just made me think of, Cheyenne, was like, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've used the term decentralized a lot. And I think it's important to um, be transparent and say that, you know, decentralization is the goal. And, uh, you know, there are great examples of, of DAOs out there that are very decentralized. It's, it's their applications are fully on chain. Maybe they have a, a, a front end hosted on IPFS, but 
just because something says it's DeFi or a DAO says it's decentralized doesn't always mean that they're fully decentralized. And that's, I think, understandable because the, you know, they're oftentimes they have really good intentions. They're it's and it's it's their goal is to get more decentralized. Hopefully they're trending to be more decentralized over time as opposed to more centralized. But decentralization is difficult and we're we're building the planes while flying it, right? So it is it, it's really hard to go full decentralization on day one. So you, you might hear the term progressive decentralization, which is this idea of uh, you know, doing what we can reasonably to be decentralized now. Um, and then having a, a roadmap to, to be eventually become more decentralized. Also knowing that we don't have to solve all these problems ourselves. One of the great things about this space is that there's a bunch of bright minds working on solutions to all these different problems because there's incentives for them to do so. And the solutions they're building are oftentimes just open source public goods, or at least something that we can is composable and that we can leverage ourselves. Uh, yeah, exactly. To that point, like um, similar to back in the day when a project would just call block weird blockchain and uh, decentralized finance doesn't mean they're decentral. They have to like the main point is like you, you should be able to like transparency, transparently communicate with the community of like what you are, who you are, how things are working to be able to like progressively get there. That's the main point, like communicate with the community rather than because like, as you said, if there's a problem that you cannot solve, you need to put it out there so someone else can jump on it. Uh, and if you just like re erase all the like um, signs of that problem, then no one knows that there is a problem there to solve. And that's one of the things that like maybe some of the recent controversies around like could possibly find a solution later on. Yeah, and you're so right. I love what you said about trans like transparency and stuff and communication. I think that as long that's where projects get into trouble. If they say if they say they're decentralized and stuff, um, it's fine to call yourself a DAO just because that's the the, ter the buzz term and stuff, and it can mean a lot of different things. But if you like lie about uh, you know your actual security setups and stuff, and um, uh, that's where projects get into trouble, basically. So just being transparent, I think, is 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 fine. And uh, to, as long as you're transparent and communicate, I think I think it'll be fine. But otherwise, you're LARPing, uh, or and I think a lot of us are LARPing, right? And that's another in interesting term that you'll hear. LARPing, LARPing comes from uh, it's live action role playing, and it's uh, comes from the sport of people uh, meeting up in in real life to uh, to play out these fantasy games and stuff. Um, and so you'll hear that term applied to crypto. Uh, a lot of us are LARPing, right? Where where we are, uh, you know doing our best to represent this decentralized future and stuff because it's, we believe in it. And because, you know, we want to, it's compelling and we want to share that vision with the, the broader world and stuff. But, you know, we recognize we're not quite there yet, basically. So sometimes you gotta, um, you know, you gotta walk or talk the talk or before you walk the walk or I don't know, there's some, there's probably some good sayings out there that I can't fake it till make it fake it till you make it. That's what I was like. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's with anything, though, like anytime something is new and innovative, it can't evolve in a vacuum. And it, generally, things don't just start off as what the end goal is, right? There has to be building, biddling going on to get to that point. Otherwise, like, I mean, that's just how humans work. And it's how technology works. The internet wasn't what it is today, even a year ago, right? Everything keeps changing and evolving. And as long as that conversation is open and transparent and people are um, upfront about what the goals are and acknowledging what some of the current limitations are, then I think that um, that's kind of that important piece of getting to the end goal. And like you said, it prog progression, it's progressive decentralization, not necessarily everything's decentralized right away because I don't think everything can ever be decentralized right away because it starts with an idea and generally ideas start with one person until it becomes something that's yeah, shared. I, I remember right? um, Zuko, Zcash founder in one of the financial financial crypto conferences, he was doing this talk and he mentioned, it was like four years ago, I think, he mentioned the only decentral cryptocurrency is Dogecoin because no one's working on it. Um, and that was like four years ago, it was true before all Elon Musk and stuff happening. But it was one of the interesting things. You cannot have a developer team being like fully, like it's, it doesn't work. Like when you're progressing, getting to the point that like the system works, you need that management, that like coordination between a small team and comes with like experts, like you need to be expert to be able to participate in there. There's a lot of things around like EIPs. It's a big, big thing to open up. Like uh, I don't think we can, we can like in eight minutes or something talk about What's that. What's an but, EIP, Cheyenne? 
Oh, um, I have like a few videos on that, but EIP is Ethereum Improvement Proposal, which is coming from BIP, Bitcoin Improvement Proposal, which is coming from PEP, uh, Python Enhancement Protocol, which is coming from IF, uh, IFC, uh, I forgot what that one on RFC, like request for comments from IETF, like from the whole Internet Engineering Task Force. There's a whole, like a video, I talk about this history and how EIP works in within three minutes. And it's like, I feel like everyone has to go to like 0.5x to be able to understand what I'm saying, because it's so, so fast. If you tweet that uh, today or send it to me, we'll put it on C4's um, Twitter so people yeah, can hear sure. about the history. But so for an sure. Ethereum improvement um, proposal is when somebody suggests a change to be made to the Ethereum protocol. And then, well, you can explain it better than me. I see. Yeah, so there are different tracks. Over. Yeah, there are different tracks where some EIPs are like at the core, which are like the protocol and others. And usually like anyone can basically start the conversation on Ethereum Magician Forum on some of the others. And you need to have a champion. There's a whole process which evolved two years and got better. There is a lot of like talk about like it's it not being like decentral enough, but it's a development process. It's, it is getting there. Um, one thing I love about that is like, it's the the forums, the Git, GitHub, the calls, like it's all recorded. Everything is there. If you want to like find out the history of like some small change within the protocol, you can go back exactly who started the conversation, what was the, what were the arguments, and that's the, the like, beauty of this space to be able to like track back and see what uh, like there's something in Gitcoin again GitHub. Uh, which call like git blame which for every line you can go click and say like who was the one changing this specific line and we should be able to like do that for all the protocols in this space and all the decisions if we call ourselves like decentral to be able to like see see that utxo like see the uh, like the trace of like the change um yeah i think i started going deep in the down the rabbit hole there but it's a good rabbit hole for sure it's and so yeah <laughs> And yeah, if you ever hear an EIP, like, you know, EIP 712 or EIP 1559, and you're not sure what it means, you can, like, try and say, you can just Google it and find a whole wealth of information that will explain what that means to you. And you can also just ask whoever's telling you about it. You know, I think if you were to say, oh, you know, will you tell me about this EIP, they'd be happy to, to explain it to you. Mm -hmm. what's, what's the difference between EIP and ERC? I actually, I'm not sure I fully grok that difference myself. Uh, so I think, so at the end, they're the same, um, but the way like even early on if you search erc20 early on you find a lot of references calling calling it eip20 uh it's just like i don't know if any any part in the time someone was like let's decide not call it eth2 call it something else like you know the similar conversation never happened around erc20 it's just like the way the got the one it goes back to the implementation of the code that someone called it like erc20 and then that became more of a thing that's my take me if if it's not true, please, like, I would love to know the actual history there. Like, someone can re re like, reply to a tweet or somewhere. I would love mm -hmm. to know. But that's, I think that's something that organically happened. Uh, but ERC is um, Ethereum request for comment. EIP is Ethereum improvement proposal. There's also, like, EEP, you can say, same as, like, Ethereum enhancement proposal, similar to PEP for Python. But, I mean, all these are the same concept at the end. And so interesting too, just like you said, to, to actually look at the history, because like, if you're a newcomer to the space, you like, uh, you are standing on the shoulders of giants and, um, there's, you know, the, the crypto blockchain space as difficult as it is to navigate today, it is loads better than it was five, 10 years ago. And, uh, you know, things like a 12 word seed phrase and stuff that was like BIP Bitcoin improvement proposal number 42, I think, or 39 or something. It's like, there are a series of these, like, uh, of these improvement proposals that, uh, brought us to where we are today. And we're still, you know, the cool thing is, is that if anyone else has an idea for how to improve either of these protocols, they can make an EIP and discuss it with the community, get it implemented. Yeah, well, okay, we are um, starting to get to the end of our time here, but I think that based on what we've talked about, C4 is going to end up doing something like this again, because there are so many more terms and things that people have asked that we don't have time to get to. Um, 
But yeah, it's constantly changing and evolving. And I think one of the big takeaways from this should be that it's okay not to know everything. No one knows anything. We had a really um, fun certified Ethereum professional committee call a few weeks ago in which the committee members and I were just talking about what we don't know that we wish we did know. And it was actually hilarious to every, for everyone to toss out, like, I heard about this, what is this? And to acknowledge like all of these experts in the space still don't know everything because it's pretty much impossible to do so. Um, and to be able to acknowledge that that's an impossibility and to then open up room to ask questions in a way that people feel comfortable. And so I hope anyone who's um, watching or listening knows that C4 is open for questions. We welcome questions. You can message us on Twitter if you don't want to do it publicly, but we are a certification body, but we also really believe in education. And we know that certifications don't exist if people aren't educated. And so we have educational materials for our certified Bitcoin professional exam. We also have materials coming out for our certified Ethereum professional exam, which um, has been out for a few months. And we've got a book that's going to be coming out to help people prepare for it. Um, within like a couple months, it'll be out in Q1 2022. Um, and so basically, we're here in order to serve the community and to help others learn more about cryptocurrency, about Bitcoin, about Ethereum. And I also know that places like Giveth that Willie was talking about and places like Shapeshift are very open to feedback into helping people learn and get into the space. It is, like we said, a really welcoming environment and no question it shouldn't be asked. If you have the question, ask it so that you then know. Um, we hope that some of the people who are watching are gonna be at ETH Denver. I'm gonna be there. Are you both gonna be there? Yes. Oh yeah. Wouldn't mess yeah. up the world. Okay, cool. Well, so hopefully we see, well, we'll all see each other and hopefully we see a bunch of the people watching. Um, anything else that you, either of you want to add before we- yeah, I just um, want to add like about uh, the CEP was certified through provision, which took us two years to make. And one of the things I'm looking forward and I hope we can gather a committee around it is similar to like back in the day, there was this certification called Certified, Eth uh, Eth certified Ethical Hacker. I really want to like get somewhere to have, so have a certificate, like certified uh, ethical DAO member or like Taoist. So something like that, because there's a lot around it and we need to like find some standards of knowledge, ethics around how to participate in a DAO and what that means. I don't have any clue how, what that looks like. I'll hope, I hope that by end of 2022, we, we have some guidelines and something around it. Well, so that's actually one of the reasons that I started participating in Shapeshift DAO. I really like what they're doing, um, what we're doing. I think it's important, but also there are these pieces that are needed in any DAO, pretty much any organization, so that people can show, um, prove, and other people can test that the people that are joining and becoming core members really understand things. And so um, what you're talking about in terms of like the ethics around a DAO, and I also think like there's a piece that exists, but is missing in a more um, like, I don't want to say formal, but more like um, rich and robust way, which would be security and making sure that people that are joining and being paid on chain understand how wallets work and how to make sure that you're using a YubiKey or you're using LastPass because as more people from outside the cryptocurrency space begin to join because they have these amazing skills and are starting to be excited about what's happening. They need this education, right? So not just like what Bitcoin is and how it works, um, what Ethereum is and how it works, but actually like the additional details of security and what you're talking about, Cheyenne, too. So um, C4 is growing. This is a year of growth for us, and we're going to be increasing um, committees, exams. We're going to be welcoming more people that are in the community into helping us create the questions for exams. So historically, we've had committees create the content of the exams. And that is something that has been super effective and great, but we also recognize that the community has as good of questions as anybody else. So people who are CBP and CDPs are going to be getting access to CrowdQ, our exam platform, and helping add questions that they think should be on it. 
And so um, that'll be the same thing if there's um, certificates that relate to um, what what did you call it, Cheyenne? What was your like ethical DAO member? Like I, I have to like it just like Taoist. So. Yeah, yeah, Taoist. I like Taoist. Yeah. Taoist. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Um, if people are interested in what we're talking about with our certifications, what C4 is doing, please reach out to us, um, info at cryptoconsortium.org or on Twitter or any of our social media platforms. Same thing with being involved with Giveth or um, Shapeshift. I put the links to the Discord for um, Shapeshift and for Giveth in the um, YouTube chat. Is there anything else anyone wants to bring up before we sign off? I think that was an excellent sign off. So yeah, just plus one reiterate DYOR friends, go get CBP and CEP certified and um, come, come doubt with us. Uh, you know, we're all going to make a friends. Yeah. GM. Yeah. GM, everyone. GM, everyone. Thank you. All right. Take care. Thanks. So.